All right, people, as you heard today, we're going to be talking about a novel new way of harnessing the energy of the sun. But before we do that, I want to quickly talk about today's sponsor, Mauser Electronics. Now, you guys know we love Mauser. Mauser is one of the world's biggest electronic suppliers. And what that means is that they have a lot of connections to a lot of different industries. And they're typically on top of it, but like what the state of the art is in any given category. So they have these Mauser technical resources that dives deep into, you know, new stuff coming out, new technologies, and, um, you know, even some how-to guides on how you can set up your own equipment, what stuff you can get from Mauser to accomplish some of those new things that are coming out. But this, this one that we're going to link in today's show notes is about capturing the energy of waves and tides. Because if you think about green energy, it's not just one source, right? It's not like one silver bullet. It's actually an array of resources. You have geothermal, you have solar, which is what we're talking about today, but you also have waves and they have the benefit of pretty much always waving. <laughs> like unlike the sun, you don't have these like, you know, crazy peaks and then at night you're just not generating anything. Waves are semi-consistent. That's semi actually something we'll talk about in today's episode, yeah. right? Is some of the disadvantages of rooftop solar with the peaks of energy. You need to design a system that's able to capture that peak of energy um, and handle it without wasting any electricity. But the fact of the matter is it's actually underutilized during the rest of the day. Um, tides and the waves, they're, they're pretty much always waving, like you said. So it's, it's a more consistent um, yield of energy distribution across the clock. And it yields 24 hours a day, which is awesome. Yeah. And, and there's like, countries that are already leveraging this, uh, this behavior this natural behavior in the oceans, like the UK and Portugal, they're the leaders in harnessing energy from the ocean. And this article like just kind of goes into that. They talk about the components required to do it. Um, they even have some links on how you can uh, purchase some of those equipments if you want to try them out uh, for Mauser. But yeah, um, if you're interested in digging into this a little bit more, feel free to check it out. We're going to be linking in the show notes as always. And with that said, let's jump into today's article. Now, we're going to be talking about these creative IV shaped, like the plant IV, uh, solar systems that you can put on the facade of your building, like, you know, the walls, the exterior walls, instead of on top of your roof. And this is coming from the TNO, which is the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. It's coming from an actual, well, they're, they're the ones leading it, but there's like a joint effort that's going on too, which I think makes this all the more interesting. Um, there's architects working on it. There's uh, composite developers that came up with new novel materials. And then you have people like the contractors actually getting the permits so that they can start setting these up and testing them out. And all of this is installed at high tech campus Eindhoven, which is like a conglomerate of all these different startups and universities. Um, it's like the Silicon Valley of Europe, if you will, where all these high tech companies, institutions, researchers, they're all co-located. They're all working on high-tech projects together. Um, something that I definitely have on my bucket list to go visit because I've heard so much cool stuff about it. And one of the things is they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is. And instead of just talking about facade generated solar energy, which is where you've got the solar panels on the sides of the building, as opposed to on the roof, so we've got facade versus rooftop. Instead of just talking about the benefits of facade generated solar power, they're also plastering these creative ivy shaped solar panel systems over the facades in their own buildings in that high tech campus, which again, um, makes me excited to go visit it one day. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And I, I want to, again, quickly note on the collaboration with like having architects involved and the rest of the group. One of the biggest challenges with solar panels is like, you know, logically, depending on where you are and, you know, the cost of getting the panels, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's a great deal. It's good for the environment. It can be a great um, way for you to save money on your energy costs. But it's just kind of ugly. Like that, that is the, the root of the problem. And I'll never forget Top Gear. It's like that car show, one of my favorite shows of all time. I remember when the first uh, McLaren production car, the MP4-12C came out, Jeremy Clarkson, probably one of my favorite hosts on that show was like, it's just, it drives well, everything's well, but I can just tell it was designed by an engineer. It has no soul. Like I just don't like it. And that's the problem with solar panels. Like for the most part, you can tell an engineer designed that they're perfect shapes. They do the job, but they don't have oomph when it comes to design. 
and now and we're all you know we're we're all engineers here yeah or, i don't know but you know it's not to say that all like all engineers are stupid or they can't design something that looks beautiful but it i agree with you man the fact that they're like going so far as to include the architects which are like the artists of the construction world including the architects from the start might help them develop a solution here that's got this artistic balance it feels like it's got soul in it and I'll, I'll encourage everyone to go check out the article in the show notes um click on it and the big picture that comes up you can see it looks like someone's designed and installed an art installation on the side of this building not someone who's trying to like just brute force generate a sun a ton of solar power um and i think we're used to seeing solar installations be like let me plaster every single part of this roof that i can with these ugly you know not attractive huge flat solar panels versus this is like feels like it's got more finesse to it feels like something that people can coexist with and even be excited about the designs there you go yeah and an additional benefit there being that it actually pays the bills for itself by generating a bunch of electricity too and the article like goes deeper into how the technology that they're using allows like the, these creators to come up with facade solar cells that can be this like the shape of a logo. So imagine like, you know, my office has a massive logo of the, of the name on the building, right? And it's just there for show. But what if it could actually harness some solar power? That'd be super cool. And now think about every single office that is in like DC or like really anywhere, any metropolitan city in the world. Like, just imagine all those signs that do nothing but be there for show, generating some sort of solar power. And now let's extend that, right? They actually talked about how in the in the Netherlands, there is something like 2,200 square kilometers of facade that can be used, that gets sunlight on it. And about 660 of those are suitable for actually having solar panel, panels on them, which by their estimates comes out to 58 gigawatts of energy potential. Like that's not a trivial amount. That that's a pretty significant amount of energy that you're getting out of it. Which, when you you, you put that into perspective, right, with how much solar the Netherlands already has that's what I was installed. Say. Yeah, it's like just under 19 gigawatts, 18.8 mm-hmm. gigawatts. So all the solar installations in the Netherlands as of 2022, we've got almost three times as much as a potential sitting on the sides of all these buildings where we haven't yet installed, you know, additional solar on the facades of these buildings. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I, I think there's a lot of promise there. And I think the big value add here, at least in my opinion, is twofold. It's one, coming up with a desirable architecture for these solar cells. Like, I don't know how much of a problem this is, but I know like around where I live, homeowners associations just straight up don't allow people to set up solar cells because they're ugly, right? Yeah. They, they are afraid of bringing down property values. So even if 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 it's like a good solution for the environment, and again, your pocket, the organization, your society might not want it because it's ugly. So if you can, you know, solve that problem, adoption is probably going to go up, and that's that's feeding more into the bottom line of the world becoming more sustainable. But on the other end, it's also showing us that there's areas that you can leverage for solar power which have typically been neglected, like um, pretty much all solar you know solutions that I've seen are for your rooftop, but I've never seen anything that's like hey you can put this up on the side of your building and i think that has some like pretty critical advantages especially you know debris setting on top of soles if they're the cells if they're you know laying horizontally versus vertically um yeah my two cents well and i will say i i was curious about this and i dove into it as well and i've got a little bit of a hot take that's been cooking uh, drop it um you know we're we're used to seeing rooftop solar as like the poster child for solar energy generation. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, Especially in areas near the equator and the Southern hemisphere, it makes a lot of sense for you to put the solar panel on the roof um, where you can generate the most power. You get the highest peak power output during the day when the sun's straight overhead. Um, But when you start to add a couple more nuancing factors is what what I'm gonna call them, like the fact that the Netherlands are actually very far north Mm -hmm. on the earth, um, so that the peak angle for the solar panels isn't actually going to be flat so that you can get sun from straight above. The sun actually is mostly hitting the southern face of these buildings as opposed to the roof. Um, in addition, um, the Netherlands are pretty urbanized, right? So we're talking about a lot of buildings and crammed in a small space where there actually isn't a ton of roof space 
but there's actually a ton of wall space by comparison if you've got these buildings that are high rises so to speak um and then in addition to all that we talk about the visual appeal of it um some of these facade installations have the benefit of being able to look like building art as opposed to these big flat ugly panels on top of the building and then i think the real x factor here is something that we alluded to when we were talking about waves and tidal energy from the sponsored article at the beginning of this episode is the fact that the yield distribution curve of a facade solar energy is actually a lot flatter over the day so we don't have as high of a peak of energy production during the middle of the day when the sun's straight overhead the energy production actually dips right around noon when the sun's straight overhead if you can imagine because there's not a ton of direct sunlight hitting the side of the building instead right. it's hitting the roof but because the the curve is a lot longer and flatter if you, if you can imagine like a shallow hill that a generates electricity spread out over the entire day as opposed to a, a steep mountain that has a giant peak in the middle of the day you're able to downsize the um, electrical architecture associated with this because you don't have to handle large amounts of power in the middle of the day you can actually have a less expensive installation here because it's handling trickle, pa trickle power as opposed to like high peaks of power that end up going underutilized during the remainder of the day and the way I like to view it is it's it's like if you were going for, you know, trying to go for a really, really long run, um, you're able to actually sustain a pretty decent pace if you're, say, I'm going to go walk 15 miles. Um, but, you, you know, most general people, I think, could actually do that in a day. They can walk 10, 15 miles, no problem. But if you were to say, like, oh, you have to go 15 miles, but you have to get to a full-blown sprint in the middle of that, you know, right during the middle of your run, you have to get to a full-blown sprint, and then you have to, like, cool down back to a walk at the end. Um, it's going to take a much higher toll on your body. And it feels very, very similar the way that the electrical architecture has to be set up to support high power generation during the peak of the day for solar. Um, these facade solar installations actually allow us to do something that's a little bit more grid friendly, so to speak. And that, that's actually a huge issue with solar generation today is we can create a bunch of power with solar panels, but the grid can't actually handle all the solar power that we're generating all that well. No, that's a really good point. And I'm kind of curious just based on what you said. Like just imagining a building as a cube, right? I'm wondering if you had just a top covered with solar panels and you, you know, you got that peak energy production in the middle of the day. I wonder how that compares to if you just had one side of that cube covered with solar panels, the same area that you would have on the top. I'm guessing you would get more consistent power generation up until noon, you know, when it reaches the top and now it starts going on the other side. Um, but I wonder what the total amount would compare to and if you would need basically to double up the area that you're putting solar panels on to match that peak power output, which, you know, that, that might still be a good solution because you have a higher initial cost. But like you said, you get more consistent power and it's a smaller load on the grid. On the other side of this, like, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted about where this would be a good solution for. At least when I consider, you know, the area that we live, Northern Virginia, we have, we don't have like this super compact uh, set of living spaces like you would in a typical city, but we have, you know, a lot of townhouses that are connected together. And a lot of them, I think would be a, a good candidate for a solution like this. However, we're still in an area that's developing quite rapidly. So I could totally see someone setting something like this up, you know, and it costs, let's say, you know, 50, $60,000. That's, that's not cheap. And then within a year, you have a new construction that's going to totally block, let's say, half of the sunlight that you're expected to get anyways. So I'm wondering like, if, if this is going to become something we want to have installed in, in our homes and become like a normal thing, would we have to change building codes to accommodate that and make sure that your investment isn't just going to totally you know, become useless? Or like, I don't know, th this seems like, you know, j just like the inception of the product itself, it, sounds, it seems like the long-term answer also requires a uh, multidiscipline effort to figure this out. Oh, I agree. And especially what you're saying around, you know, the, I think you've got a higher propensity for the side of your building to be shaded as opposed to the top. Um, and that's the same case, even in the urban areas where we're not expecting there to be, you know, a major new development, so to speak, like you're saying, like, oh crap, now there's a new building blocking my entire house. Exactly. Um, I think part of that is shown in the fact that this team, you mentioned it earlier, they said there's 2,200 square kilometers of facade in the Netherlands that they thought like 
maybe we could put solar panels on this. And then they did some analysis based on which ones actually consistently get sun and aren't shaded. And that dropped it to about 660 square kilometers. So that was about 30% of all that facade was actually usable for solar electricity production. Um, I, I think it would be interesting personally, at least for me to understand how exactly they got from that 2200 down to that 660. I agree. And I imagine that, you know, depending on where you are in the world, depending on how urban it is, how much there's continued development, how much there's tree cover, um, that 30% of usable facade might change and shift depending on where you are in the world. But I do think it's interesting. Um, and especially a lot of the nuanced parts that we talked about why rooftop solar, you know, is seems like the textbook solution, but facade solar might be the actual real solution that makes it out into the real world. The Netherlands seems like the perfect storm for something like this to start to take hold. Like we said, it's very far north. So the southern face of that building is something that you actually want to be angling toward to get a lot of solar production. Um, it's pretty urbanized. So we're, we're talking about there's not a lot of big open fields where I can go place a bunch of solar panels. Um, and then on top of that, I feel like, especially at high tech campus Eindhoven, but also just, I feel like the Netherlands in general seem to be pretty tech forward and, um, pretty art forward. And I, I feel like that's a, a place that we might be able to easily adopt technology like this, that looks like art that can go on the side of a building and helps us produce, re you know, renewable energy. Um, I'm excited to see this take hold there. And I think one indicator from my side that I think that this is important and it's potentially here to stay is the fact that this project not only had backing from industry, not only had backing from universities, it also received pretty substantial government funding as well, which to me shows that it's important and shows that there's potential impact um, across the board if there were to be more grant programs or legislation to try and encourage use of, of this type of facade solar cells in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to recap, basically what we just talked about in this episode, right? The traditional approach to solar has been rooftop because, you know, that's where you get the peak energy in the middle of the day. Well, these folks from the Dutch Organization of Applied Scientific Research were like, what if we flip the script and utilize facades? Because we got a lot of that in urban areas. And this is actually a joint effort. They got people involved that are coming up with new composites. They got architects involved to make sure that the new design is something that people would like to see, right? If they like it, they're probably going to adopt it. Unlike the various HOAs that completely hate solar cells because of how ugly they are and potentially bring down property values. So that seems like a great idea, but what is the actual potential of this? Well, just in the Netherlands alone, there's something like 2,200 kilometer square kilometers of facade that can be used for solar. And 660 of that is actually very suitable for solar, which, you know, it results in about 58 gigawatts of output by their calculations. And for some context, in 2022, all of the solar output in the Netherlands was about 19 gigawatts. So that's a, that's a pretty substantial bump that you can get from this. So imagine if this solution could be utilized in the United States or maybe even everywhere in the world. How much could we bump up our production? And by the way, the solar production from the facades is a lot more consistent, which means that you don't have to worry about peaks and then some you know, insane energy storage technique to store the excess energy or putting it back into the grid which is a load that's actually kind of a burden to handle. So that's the solution they came up with. That's the potential for the future that's powered by solar energy. Thank you, Nailed I try. I try. All right. Um, I think good time to wrap up the episode. Do we have to give any shout outs? We missing I'll anything? just say, you know, we, we've shared this before, but a couple of folks have reached out. They continue to ask, how can we help? They enjoy the podcast. They're excited about it. They're excited about being a part of the community. What's the biggest way I can help? Um, I th I'd say there's two big things you can do. Number one is if you haven't yet, wherever you're listening to this podcast, leave us a review. We hope we deserve five stars. We hope we've done enough to earn that five star rating from you. If not, we'd love if you could reach out and let us know exactly what it is that we need to change to get there because we're looking to always continuously improve this. Absolutely. The second thing is if you've already leave it, left us a review and you've already been happy and you're already a big part of this community, We'd love if you could take this episode, share it with a friend, uh, someone who might be interested in why rooftop solar might be a relic of the past or someone who's interested in art and technology and where they intersect or just someone who you think might be interested in hearing interesting technology on a weekly basis that's boiled down and broken down and easy to understand. Um, that's the biggest way you can help us. And obviously that encourages us and helps us to continue growing and helps us to keep publishing this on a weekly basis. We're now 137 weeks in um, and haven't missed a beat. So that's all 
thanks to folks like you who are a part of the community and help us continue to grow. Absolutely. Thank you guys for listening as always and catch you in the next one. Peace.